Okay, uh, so what we have is chapter 3, which is financial statements. In section 1, we did overview, said that there are four major statements. Income statement uh, with the equity statement, owner's equity statement, balance sheet and cash flow. For financial analysis we don't do too much the uh, we don't do too much the owner's equity. We focus on the other three the income statement, balance sheet and cash flow statement. Uh, why study financial statements? Number one is financial statement analysis. Number two is financial control. Number three is forecasting and planning. The accounting principles we discussed were three. It was the revenue recognition principle, then we have the matching principle, and the historical cost principle. Section number two was the income statement. And income statement can be designed in two methods. You still get the same income. The same income is the same. You could do single step, single step. In a single step statement, you list all the revenues, everything you have, and then you do total revenues. And then you list all expenses that you have, and then do the total expenses. And finally, you get the net income. And the other type is multiple step. Multiple step is just a little bit more complicated, but it gives you a little bit more information. In a multiple step, you, you get first the gross profits, then you get EBIT earnings before incomes and taxes, then you get the EBT, earnings before taxes, and finally you get the net uh, income. Let's see what we have here. All right, part of this is, again, all the income statement is about business profits. So, we look now at firm profitability. And profitability is about the ability to make profits. Is the firm able to make profits or not? That's pretty much the most important question about any businessman, especially if you're on your own business, the big question is, can you make a profit or you cannot make a profit? That's the big question. All right, profitability can be measured in many different ways. There are very different things. So, number one, firm profitability can be measured with the gross profit.
This is based on the cost of goods sold. You acquire an iPhone for $500 and you sell it for $700. Your markup is the difference between the sale price and the acquisition price. So the markup difference is $200. Okay? And $700 on $700 on $500 is 40%. Number two is operating profit margin. simply your operating profit. The operating profit, uh, one of the measure is EBIT. This is earnings before interest and taxes. And if it's a margin, is a ratio, you divide by sales. All right, so that's another one. How much profit, meaning operating profit, you make out of sales. Now, notice, remember, I told you last time, and it is worth repeating because, again, experience shows that when you tell it only 10 times, students around the world don't learn it. There is no concept of profit. We don't know what profit is. Students love to use profits, as well as businessmen, but it is not clear what a profit means. We just don't know what it means. It is not defined. We know what is gross profit. We have the exact definition of gross profit. We have the exact definition of operating profit, okay? And later on, we have the exact definition of net profit. Net profit. All right, let's get the attendance sheet. Attendance sheet, please. Where is the attendance sheet? So basically the question is, out of a dollar of sales, what is the percentage of gross mortgage margin, what is the percentage of operating margin, and what is the percentage of net profit margin? This is a simple question. The next section is so-called 
G A A P. This is an American concept. It's called a generally accepted accounting principles. These are the guiding principles that are used by American accounting professionals. Now, what we have here is basically they are almost the same as the international financial reporting standards. They are, in other words, you have the American standards and they have the international standards. And they are almost the same. They're like 99% the same. If you understand the American standards, it's very easy to learn these. There are just a few differences. If you study and learn the international standards, it's very easy to switch to the American standards. Uh, most of Europe has switched to these, and most of America now is switching to these. Now, America is evolving, and I don't no specialize in accounting. My understanding is that most American companies can choose between these two, can choose between these two, and most of them are choosing the international standards, okay? But it's pretty much the same thing when it comes to especially the fundamental principles, the fundamental interpretations, they're the same. It gets more complicated when you're doing some financial institutions accounting, when you get into insurance contracts or derivatives or off-balance sheet. In other words, when you get into the very advanced stuff, there will be some minor uh, differences. All right, let's see. Uh, let's do a few keywords which you will hear a lot uh, in uh, America. Uh, this is about companies managing earnings. They like to say, oh, we manage earnings. To manage earnings. Manage in this particular case is pretty much the same as manipulating it. Is earnings manipulation. Basically, businesses always like to make their earnings look better than they really are. We call this, you put a nice lipstick on the earnings. It looks a whole lot better than it is, okay? So, managing earnings is the same as manipulation. It makes things appear better than they are. A second thing is they usually do what's called the smoothing, to smooth or smoothing the earnings. By business, by nature, Sometimes earnings will be high, sometimes low, then high, then high, then low, then low, then high. Okay? So, in nature, everything is not perfectly linear. Just like temperature outside in the day goes up, it goes down. Now, one day is a little hotter, one day is a little colder. Uh, if you have a restaurant, maybe there's a rain. Or some other issue. Well, what they do in smoothing is they say, okay, well, this time I'm going to report a little less, next time I'm going to report a little more, a little less, a little less, a little more, and they make earnings grow more smoothly. Okay? So, they, this smoothing, they make the business to appear stable. They say, oh, our business is very stable, okay? But it's still managing, as in manipulating the earnings. Now, of course, a lot of times you have plain cheating. 
and have played fraud. A lot of times companies will do that so that managers themselves can profit. The reason for this is that a lot of times managers get options, options, as in they get a particular option which when the stock price reaches a certain price level, okay, the option gets in the money and they get to profit themselves significantly when the stock price goes up. So what they want to do is they want to drive the stock price up high, they can cash out their options, and after that the stock price can crash. That doesn't matter. You know, if they can pocket it 10 million, 20 million, 50 million, they can pocket in a few million through their options, they're happy. So they'll do they'll cheat and they'll do fraud. That's what they typically do, especially when they have options. Same thing applies with bonuses, executive bonuses. A lot of uh, executives will have year-end bonuses based on some measure of earnings, could be operating earnings. So if your bonus is uh, correlates to the earnings, you will manipulate the earnings, make a nice big number so you can get a big bonus. Now this is what happens with commercial banks. Commercial banks will generate a lot of credit. Okay, they make they generate a lot of credit. And commercial banks, I'd say, uh, in the United States as well, let's say in my home country, Bulgaria, but it's pretty much the same, pretty much the same in Thailand and over here in Cambodia. When you're creating, uh, let's say, mortgages, mortgage loans for the purchase of, of a house, if you're a mid tier manager. So you're a manager in the bank, but you're not at the top, you're not at the bottom, you're somewhere in the middle. You will create this year a lot of mortgage loans. Maybe you're not a person, but you have a team of 10 people. And each person may be creating, let's say, 50 mortgages a year. And there are 10 people who create 500 mortgages. They get a bonus. Well, what's the bonus? The bonus size is big enough to buy you a little apartment, a little condo. That's a nice bonus if you can hit your quota. So what bankers will do is they'll create a lot of credits, and at the end of the year, they'll collect a bonus worth one nice apartment. You do this two, three, or four years, you get three or four apartments. Now, the loans may actually go bad, okay? You can actually lose a lot of money two, three, four years down the road. And the bank can go bankrupt, but if you're an employee in the bank, you don't care. We call this moral hazard. You collected three bonuses, they are worth already three apartments. Hey, after New Year, after you collect your bonus, the bank can go bankrupt. That's okay. You already keep the three apartments that you got, plus all the salaries, which are pretty big and pretty big. So that's where the problems come from. They come from employees who could pocket an awful lot of money if the earnings look real good. And it's worth cheating, and it's worth committing fraud. Now, for these, they are supposed to go in jail, but in reality, in recent years or in recent decades, they pretty much don't. You know, bankers consider themselves to be above the law and untouchable by the law. Okay, that's why they want to be bankers in the first place. You make an awful lot of money, and you know, it's kind of like Hillary Clinton, right? She's doing a lot of criminal stuff, and of course, she doesn't go to jail for that. Anyway, for bankers, that's usually the case. And other big corporate executives. So, they usually manage the earnings. When you say, oh, we manage the earnings, it sounds nice. It sounds like they're doing something right, but fundamentally, it is not right. Fundamentally, it is not correct. Okay, so, you have a process that verifies the earnings. This process is called an audit. An audit is a process which verifies the validity of the earnings and that earnings represent 
the business's operation day realistically. You don't need for the earnings to represent perfectly, but realistically is good enough. And the audit will be done by an independent, it's called accounting firm. Accounting firm, but usually they are also called auditing firm. In the United States, the auditors which are certified are called CPA, Certified Public Accountant. And in Britain, they will be ACCA. And it's a very valuable and worthwhile certification to have. Basically, when you're ACCA, you go in major businesses and you go through their accounting books to verify that their income statement, balance sheet, that their statements are proper and correct. And auditors will usually issue an audit opinion. And basically the opinion is just a statement which says whether they believe that the statements are true and correct and reflect the reality or not. All right, next section is a little trickier and very hard to teach because it's specific to the United States. Uh, I will not be teaching much about it because you don't have to learn and study the particulars of corporate taxes. You don't need to study the taxes, at least the calculations, but you still need to learn the concepts, the same concept. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. You need to learn the basic concepts because they apply for, again, any country anywhere in the world, you have basic stuff. Like income becomes taxable income. This is the income upon which you have to pay a tax. Now, how you calculate the income for every country, it's likely to be very, very, very different. In Thailand, it's going to be one way of calculation. In Vietnam, it's going to be a different way of calculation. So, how you calculate taxable income depends on the particular country. But you still need to understand the basic concept that this is the income on which there will be a tax. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. Next one is called a tax rate. And the tax rate is simply a percentage which you must pay in taxes out of tax income. In a sense, a lot of times, simply the tax equals the tax rate multiplied by taxable income. Okay. Now, taxable income in the United States usually is what I gave you on the income statement. It's called EBT, earnings, earnings before taxes, earnings before taxes, and then you calculate the taxes. Uh, based on your taxes, you have, it's called income tax liability. This is the amount of tax. Now when I say here tax, I mean it's exactly the same as income tax. Income tax liability is the amount of money that you're expected to pay to the government for taxes. 
Usually, if it's, let's say, 2016 year, for 2016, you have to pay taxes, but you're going to pay them somewhere in March or April of 2017. So in January, you will have a liability, meaning an obligation to pay your taxes for last year, but you have to pay them in two or three months. So this is simply the amount of money that you owe to the government for income taxes. Now in the United States, you're going to have federal income taxes. And states, they have to pay tax to the federal government, to the state government. Let's see anything else. All right. Next is actually a relatively important concept. Again, for every country it will be completely different. Tax rate could be, uh, let me write it out in red, marginal tax rate. Marginal tax rate. And the other one is average tax rate. The average tax rate is fairly straightforward. It's simply the total tax that you have to pay divided by your taxable income. Marginal tax rate means the following. It means only the percentage or the tax rate that you have to pay on your last income. For example, if you're making between zero and one million dollars, you pay only 10% tax. If you're making between one and 10 million, you're paying, let's say, 20% tax. And if you're making between 10 and 100 million, you're going to be paying 30% tax. And if you're making between 100 million and, let's say, 1 billion, you're paying 40%. I'm just making this up. This is not a real table. So, if you're making 1.5 million, your marginal tax rate is 20. So, for the first million, you pay 10%. For the second, third, fourth million, you pay 20%. For the 10th or 11th or 12th million, you pay 30%. So this is the uh, marginal, this is the marginal tax rate. And the average is just average out. Again, we don't need to know too much about it. If you have an accounting class or a detailed accounting class, there should be teaching you there. And you don't even need to study this for the United States. You'll need to learn this for the accounting or tax system you operate. So you need to know your own taxes in the country that you operate, okay? If you're in Thailand, it's going to be one type. In the United States, different. Usually, the tax rate, the marginal tax rate is increasing. That's how they do it. But sometimes they may do it decreasing. Sometimes they may have what's called a flat tax rate, meaning it's all the same number. In my country, uh, we have only a flat tax rate of 10%. So corporate income tax is 10%. It doesn't matter how much and how low. Personal income tax is also 10%. So we are a flat tax country of 10%. All right, let's see. There is some dividend exclusion. I don't want to go into this. Uh, let's get back to, well, it's, that's basically the section on, the section on income and income taxes. Now we move on to the next section. So next section is balance sheets. Number three. So three was income tax. Okay, income taxes. Number four, the balance sheet.
This is page 61. Okay. So, balance sheet tells you, or first of all, gives you what's called the financial position. Financial position. This is where you stand financially at one given point in time. The balance sheet is of a particular date, like December 31st. Okay. And the balance sheet will have on the one side, we call it left side, we have assets which are which is something of value which the firm owns and uses to generate income so the air that you breathe is not an asset first you don't own it you don't control it okay even though you may use it somehow to make money out of Second example, which is not an asset, is the sun. Yeah. You can go to the beach and you can use the sun as part of your profit, but you don't own the sun, you don't control it, so it's not your asset. But if you're a little restaurant, the table is your asset, okay? Uh, for the university, we have direct control over the projector, over the equipment. So, assets as long as you actually control it. You are the one who decides when and how to use it. They are your assets. That's called the left-hand side, left-hand side of the balance sheet. The right-hand side has liabilities and equity. Sometimes we'll call it owners. Equity. Owner's equity is sometimes called and is known as capital. But the word capital, as I've been explaining and will be using throughout the, uh, this course, is very confusing. The word capital has four, five very different meanings, and the word capital is very unclear what it means, because different people say different things. If you got a little restaurant, you think of your capital as your long-term assets, okay? So, they, not just assets, only the long-term assets will be your capital. But again, capital is very unclear what it means. Uh, capital could also be meant as something that you can use many times over. Capital could be meant as an asset, like, oh, whatever you can use to make money from, meaning, again, the word make money is unclear. We don't know what it means. It's kind of like bringing in money. What does it mean? It's not clear. In other words, to make money can mean to generate revenue or to generate profit as a net income. So, capital is not clear, but in accounting, we like to call capital only owner's equity. Alright, so assets, you will have what's called total assets. This will measure the size of your business. And total assets could be measured in... Book value. Book value is the value according to the accounting books. And book value will depend on the price that you paid for it. The alternative is called market. Value. Market value is the price you can get for the asset if you try to sell it. Okay. And there is one other value called replacement. Value. This is the value which 
you have to pay if you want to get that asset again in the same condition. For example, you may have a one year used taxi. It's a car which you drive and to make money out of, okay? And it will have one book value, that's the purchase price minus depreciation. It's going to have a market value, whatever you are able to sell it to. Or it's going to have a replacement value. The replacement <coughs> value is basically being able to buy a car of similar condition, okay? Usually the market value and the replacement value will be similar, but they don't have to be. They could be very different. Now, in accounting, usually you will be almost always seeing the book value. That's what you see. And book value may be very unrealistic for some long-term assets. All right, let's do this right now. Next one is assets will be long-term. Which mean the ask means the asset can be used. Well, we've got to turn the camera here, zoom in on this side. Well, it's pointing there. Better come right in front of you. Uh, long term means it can be used for more than one year. Long term asset means that the asset remains in almost the same condition after a one time use. An example will be the book. You know, I can use it, I can teach it, at the end of the semester it looks almost the same. Maybe not exactly brand new and perfect, but still good enough. I can use it again and again. Of course, a better example will be the projector. That's a nice long-term asset. Yeah, you use it, yeah, it depreciates, it gets a little old, but six months or a year later, it's almost the same in terms of value in utility. The same applies for the air conditioner, okay, long term. Yeah, I can use it two, three, five, seven years. Sure, occasionally it may break, you may have to do a little repair, but it's a long term asset. You can use it for years. Same thing applies for the tables. If you got a restaurant, your equipment, your spoons, okay. Now, if you have a plastic plate, the plastic is not long term. You can't just use it two, three, five years. But if it's a metal or porcelain, you can. So basically, the question is, can you use it many times over a long period of time, usually more than one year? That's called long term. If you use it only one time or just a few times and then you have to throw it away, if you use it just for a week or a month, like we use these markers, okay, it becomes current. For example, in the current you will have inventory. And these are goods which you intend to sell soon. All right, let's see, book value, market value, okay, balance sheet and all those things. All right, let, well, let's go through them. Current assets will include, now moving on to page 63. You got a textbook? Is it on 63? 63? All right, so inventories, well, the other standard current asset will be, of course, cash. Cash. This is the money that you have in the bank. And another very standard will be account receivables. These are Revenues, these are receivables, money that you expect to collect from your customers because you sold them on credit. So, account receivables are the result of credit, credit sales. 
A gap receivables are always the result of a customer. The customer owes you money. In other words, you gave, delivered a good or delivered a service to the customer, but the customer didn't pay immediately. Maybe they'll pay in a week or maybe they'll pay in a month, okay? Usually when the customer is a big business, they will not pay immediately, okay? Maybe they'll pay in a week, maybe in a month. You get account receivable. Let's see what else we got. Well, that's what they have over here. Now let's move on and do a few more, which are fixed assets. So, long term assets are also known as fixed assets and are called fixed assets. Okay, they're called fixed assets. That's how they call them. Usually they're fixed, like the projector is fixed, you know, the table is fixed, the air conditioner is fixed. But you also call a laptop. Laptop is not exactly fixed, but it's still long term. You can still use it for a couple of years. Okay. Uh, so you will have a separate one in there called gross. Plans and equipment. That will be a major one. What's the equipment that you have? Okay. Uh, not in the textbook, I don't see them, but we can just write a couple of them. Okay? If you own a land, land is always separate. Now, maybe you don't own land, so you don't have anything. Uh, another big one is buildings. Buildings. Okay. Now, these two people usually call real estate. But in accounting, we always differentiate, separate land from buildings. Anyone? You guys study, what's the reason? Why we separate land from buildings? We're always, do we have to do, why is that? You guys study accounting? They didn't tell you? Simple answer. Depreciation. Buildings are depreciated. Land is usually not depreciated. So, what is now depreciation? Depreciation is a loss. Well, you guys, that's nice to write because that's a nice question. And you have it everywhere in finance, everywhere in accounting. It's a very important business concept. Is a loss of value due to normal wear and tear. So, due to normal usage. So, everything, a house, equipment, machine, laptop, phone, if you use it regularly and normally, it loses some value. This loss of value, especially things like a car and a motorcycle, you know, a five-year motorcycle is worth like way less than a brand new motorcycle. Same thing applies for cars. So this is called depreciation. So when you have gross plan and equipment, you separately have depreciation, okay? We call this depreciation. You will have what's called now annual depreciation. Annual depreciation is the amount of depreciation of your assets for one year. And the other one is called accumulated.
This is the total amount of depreciation since the purchase of the assets. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Sometimes they like to say since the asset was brand new, but you may not have purchased it brand new. You may have purchased a three or five year old car or a one year old computer. So since the beginning of purchasing, all the accumulation. So if the asset is three years old, it's the annual depreciation for year one, plus annual depreciation for year two, plus annual depreciation for year three. That's the accumulated depreciation. And it should be net plant and equipment. Net plant. So, net plant and equipment. Net means less depreciation. So this is gross plant and equipment minus accumulated depreciation. Let's see what else we got. Alright, well next one, let me see where I have some board. Okay. I can go back in here and do some liabilities. Alright, first of all, you have some definitions on page in the textbook 60. Two. 62 here you have a bunch of definitions, okay? So when you open on page 62, you'll see definitions. Let's see. Page 62, you have again, uh, it's a little trick here. You as students uh, should not try to memorize everything. Most of the things in business you need to understand. But sometimes you need to memorize simple basic definitions. So, you have the definitions, I'll just write them out. Cash, again, account receivable, inventory, Inventory, other current assets. So you need to have these definitions, and these will be the current ones. Then you have gross plant and equipment. I already wrote it. Accumulated depreciation, I already wrote it, net plant and equipment. Okay, next one, you have current liabilities. Current liabilities. The word current means short term. It means payable within less than one year. And you can have a whole bunch of them. Let's see what we have. First big one is uh, accounts payable. Oh, it's time to go. Money you owe to your customers. Notes payable. Let's see what else. And I'm going to finish. And separately, you will have
Hey guys, long-term debt. Long-term debt is separated into two parts. These are payments you have to make within two, three, five, six months. That part goes into the current liabilities. And then long-term debt is all the other money that you have to pay more than one year into the future. So all long-term debt you gotta divide. Part which is current and part which is long-term. And that's good enough to finish for uh, today, and I'll be doing a lot more next time. Start to finish. Alright, Now let's clean up that attendance. Guys, you gotta learn. It's